If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. You're listening to Christian Answers Live. I'm Lee Meckley, Director of Radio Outreach for Christian Answers, along with Jim Tungate. Today we have uh, a guest that is going to be of interest to any of you that might have been uh, caught up in the uh, not-too-long-past Herald Camping Affair. And also going back to 88 reasons why Christ will return in 1988. Mm -hmm. Now, this, in in many uh, evangelical circles, has come to be regarded as kind of a joke, but it's serious. I mean, let's face it, there is many people out there to where they are uh, very serious about Christ is going to return on this particular day. And we continue to think that simply because several of these dates have been set and Christ did not come, uh, that, okay, that'll take care of the problem, right? Well, no. Uh, In fact, it seems to make things worse. And so this show tonight, both hours, we're going to be talking about that problem uh, with a person who has written a book called 99 Reasons Why No One Knows when Christ will return. Hmm. So we're going to be talking about uh, soothsayers of doom. Okay. Tell our audience about the guests that we have on today. Okay, B.J. Oropesa has a B.A. in Biblical Studies from Northern California Bible College in San Jose, California. He has an M.A. in Christian Apologetics from Simon Greenleaf School of Law in Anaheim and a Master's of Theology from Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena. He's an associate researcher at the Christian Research Institute in Irvine, California, which was founded by the late Dr. Walter Martin. And he's author of the book that we're going to be talking about today, 99 Reasons Why No One Knows When Christ Will Return. Okay. And BJ, how are you this evening? Oh, fine. Uh, It's a privilege to be on your program. Well, very glad to have you, and uh, very glad to have you speaking on this particular topic. It's uh, definitely definitely, uh, relevant, and... uh, has a serious effect on people's lives. It's, you know, again, it's not just that people uh, make a mistake and and go on with it. This this is something that, uh, in many cases, seriously affects people's lives. And so, uh, tell us about the book. Uh, what caused you to? Uh, what first put in your mind the idea to write a book called Ninety Nine Reasons Why No One Knows When Christ Will Return? Well. Um Working at the Christian Research Institute, one of my areas of specialty was on eschatology and still is. Uh, Back in 1992, there was a bunch of Korean uh, sects that were talking about October 28th, 1992 as being the day of the rapture. Uh, This was a a big thing in in California and, and through, in fact, throughout the whole world specifically in Seoul, Korea, where uh, Mission for the Coming Days, Maranatha Mission, uh, Bangkok Ha, who was a boy prophet, were all predicting that in October of 1992 the rapture would take place. Now the social upheaval that this caused in Seoul, Korea was uh, uh, such uh, magnificent proportions that there were some uh, students. Now, we're talking about not not just uh, college students, but also high school students and even elementary students who would not go to school because Christ was going to return in October. Uh, They no longer went to school. And we're talking about thousands. We're talking about people who were selling their furniture, burning their furniture, a few women who got abortions so they could be light enough to go up in the rapture, a few suicides that took place because of this, uh, a person dying of fasting too long. This, this happened here in, in California. And this all in uh, as a result of this date of Christ returning on October of 1992. Now, when the day came, October 28, 1992, in the Dami Church, that's uh, 
the main church that was promoting this with a man by the name of Lee Jang Rim, who had been indicted and uh, for, for swindling his congregation out of about $4 million, I believe it was, which were to mature in uh, funds the next year. So even he seemed to not really believe that in October 28th, Christ was going to return. At any rate, at his church, what had happened on that night is the, there was police surrounding the entire building. There were detectives inside the building trying to keep order so that there would not be a mass suicide on that day. Well, thank God that there was order, and, and uh, the October 28th came and went, but there was people that were disillusioned afterwards. One of the men coming out of this church said, God, lie to us. And others were so irate after they had been deprogrammed from this date setting that they wanted to kill their pastor. Uh, there was a few violent episodes of people that were, that were stabbed, and this is the type of scenario that comes out of this millennial madness and date setting, and it's tragic. And this was the particular uh, instance that prompted you to write this book? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, and so how, in a nutshell, uh, did you respond? What was your, what was your basic approach to this um, situation? Well, I was focusing more on the groups that were here actually in California at the time. Uh, in fact, the, the boy prophet, Bangaka, who was the head of the Tabaro World Mission, was, it was right here in Southern California. And there was also another group that was very cult-like in, in uh, Los Angeles called Maranatha Mission Church where the actual congregation would congregate at about, oh, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the evening, and they would pray virtually all night till the wee hours of the morning, 4 or 5 in the morning, and pray so loud that their voices would get hoarse, and they would start having blood in their saliva. And this to them was the assurance that they would go up in the rapture if you were to able, be able to pray so hard that you would have blood in your saliva. Uh, these type of abuses were going on in this church. I, I tried to, to go inside the church and interview people, but they, they had security guards posted outside this church because so many family members tried to physically get their uh, loved one out of that church because it was so cultic. And this prompted me to, and made me realize that this eschatology date setting that's going on in the name of Christianity is tragic, and there needs to be something definitively written to counterattack these arguments that they present that we can, in fact, know the day of Christ's return. And so that's why I wrote this book, 99 Reasons Why No One Knows When Christ Will Return, in response to uh, these date setters. And it's also uh, a pun off of Edgar Wisnett's 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Would Happen in 1988. That was another. Uh, millennial madness scare that happened back in September, October of 1988. Well, does any of this uh, date setting, uh, does it ever accompany um, otherwise orthodox theology, or is it something we just find in, in cultic groups? Uh, by no means, it's, not, it, it's, it's uh, in, in just cultic groups alone. I mean, we could always point to, you know, even just recently with the uh, doomsday sects that were in Japan, uh, the Am Shinrikyo and the Order of the Solar Temple, which had Armageddon tones to it. We could point to uh, David Koresh, and we could point to these groups and say, yeah, okay, well, these are cults that we're talking about. Uh, it, it's plain and simple that, yeah, they're going to have a distorted view of Armageddon, but that's not the majority of the cases. The majority of the cases come from evangelical Christians or uh, Christians that, that uh, claim to be born again. Fortunately, this has not been something where uh, a mere theological uh, difference of opinion. This is something where people's lives are literally, literally being ruined. And we were, or you were saying that it's not just cultic groups that hold to these doctrines. It's actual, quite a few of them, or most of them perhaps, are otherwise orthodox evangelical groups. Yes, that's correct. In fact, uh, we could just look at uh, some more recent examples of date setting. Just last year, 
on June 9th, which is almost uh, exactly a year ago from today, you had a preacher on the TBN Trinity Broadcasting Network, John Hinkle, saying that on June 9th of 1994, God would rip the evil out of the earth. And this was publicized right there on TV before millions of people. Uh, he was given this platform, and he didn't say that this was the second coming of Christ, but this would be the most greatest event that ever has happened since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's a very significant claim. Uh, well, June 9th, as you know, came and went, and nothing really took place. Uh, they try to point to some earthquake that happened in South America, which uh, uh, the total amount of people killed in that earthquake was zero. And it, it just showed how, once again, evangelical people can also be setting dates. And then you had in September of 1994, Harold Camping, who wrote a bestseller in this book, you were able to find in all the Christian bookstores, 1994, with a question mark on it, by Harold Camping. Uh, he still has books. I, I, I've been to a, a Christian bookstore not too long ago, Evangelical Christian Bookstore, has another one of his works, Are You Ready?, which is uh, kind of like the follow-up to 1994. Well, September came and went, and the world did not end, as Harold Camping says, and yet he is still on the open forum, uh, in, uh, centered in Oakland, California, and he still teaches, and evangelical Christians still listen to this guy. When are we going to wake up? You know, I was watching TBN whenever Hinkle was on, and I saw him make that prophecy, and I sat there and I watched Paul Crouch just gulp it down. And Crouch even uh, made the comment that they were going to have a party on June 9th the next year, and everybody was going to get together at TBN, and they were going to party all night and wait for this event to take place. And I watched this past June 9th, and I didn't see any party. Did you? <laughs> no. Um, actually, I think they he kind was... of swept it under the rug. <laughs> He was supposed to actually be on TBN that very day on June 9, 1994. Mm -hmm. Turned out that he didn't show up that day. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, Paul and Jan Crouch uh, tried to make some type of cover-up for him, the, I believe it was the next day when they, they were talking about the incident. And it, it went down in the records as, well, yes, there was a, a, a ripping out of evil, but we couldn't see it. It, was, it happened in the spiritual realm. It didn't happen in the physical or you could, that you could see it, but in the spiritual world, there was a ripping of evil. Well, you need, what we need to do as Christians, when we, see, when we see things like that and we hear things like that, we need to ask ourselves, what's the difference between that and the Jehovah's Witnesses who said that Christ uh, would return in 1994 and that Armageddon would take place in 1994 and after 1990, not, not 19, excuse me, 1914, after 1914 came and went, the Jehovah's Witnesses said that Christ returned invisibly right. in 1914. Uh, well, they said originally that he was supposed to uh, return in 1874, and then he didn't show up in 1874, so they said, well, it'll be 1914, then he didn't show up, and they said, well, he came invisibly, then they had another prophecy for 1925, and uh, J.F. Rutherford in, uh, I think it was 1922, wrote a book called Millions Now Living Will Never Die and gave that famous speech, and nothing happened then. Then you had 1974, or 75, where they uh, set the prophecy again that uh, Christ would return and Arm Armageddon would take place. And much like the Korean groups uh, told all of the Jehovah's Witnesses to sell their belongings, sell their houses, quit school, don't have any children, because Armageddon was at hand. Yes. In, in fact, I have a, a little chart in my book on, on 99 Reasons that uh, lists some of the major false prophecies of Jehovah's Witnesses. And looking at that, and we see that, and we have no problem calling Jehovah's Witnesses false prophets. But yet, when the evangelical world, when someone does that, uh, all of a sudden uh, there's cover-up, there's, well, uh, so-and-so made a mistake or reinterpretation, and that should not happen. When a person sets a date and it doesn't come to pass, that person should be reprimanded. Uh, before we get too far off this particular area, 
Don't we have a, a similar situation that took place, I believe, back in 1844 with the dawn of Adventism, where there was Christ was supposed to come back in eight, uh, some date in 1844, and he didn't, and then they began. This began the the doctrine, I believe, of the investigative judgment. If I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's correct. Here's another uh, cover up for a mistake in, in prophecy, um, and to this day, investigative judgment, even to most Seventh Day Adventists that are still Seventh Day Adventists, is kind of the hardest pill to swallow uh, or doctrine to hold to, and because in all likelihood, when the rubber reached the road, and when you really look at this doctrine, it seems to be just an excuse for the false prediction that took place in 1844 by uh, William Miller. Hmm. There's something else, uh, another parallel, and I was going to get your comment on this to see if there's if there's any kind of correlation. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Seventh Day Ad Adventists hold to a historicist view of Revelation and, and the rest of prophecy. In other words, they, as I understand it, believe that it's being fulfilled in a continuous line from the time it was given all the way to the time of the last prophecy. It's being fulfilled in history as opposed to we're waiting for it all to be fulfilled at a later date. Now, I, I believe that Jeho Jehovah's Witnesses have a similar view of Revelation and of prophecy. Now, is can we say that the historicist viewpoint is conducive to date setting, or am I misrepresenting the... Well, there is a, a, a legitimate argument uh, to bring up that, yes, this is conducive, because especially like you look at the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have this grid where uh, well, we live in the lukewarm era right now, or the, the, the church of, of Laodicea, where uh, we're lukewarm, and therefore there's only one era left, which is This the, is the uh, historicist view that you're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, okay. the, 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 this type of view where you look at the seven churches, and, and maybe for those who are on the radio audience who don't understand, the, the, the book of Revelation talks about seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Now, the seven churches are Ephesus and Smyrna and uh, Pergamos and Thyatira and Philadelphia, Sardis, and Laodicea, which these churches are considered in, in a historicist type of view eras of the Christian church or, or church history. And we went through all these stages of church history, and we're already at the very last stage, the stage of Laodicea, which is the lukewarm church, which is going to, which uh, Christ is going to spool or vomit out of his mouth. Now, if you have that type of scenario, then you come to the conclusion that you are already at the very end of history, and so therefore Christ can return at any time. So that's what I find problematic about uh, this historicist view uh, with regard to the interpretation of the seven churches. Now, uh, there's other aspects. That there, there's more than one interpretation of a historicist view. Some would hold, like, for instance, the um, uh, some of the, the scenarios that you see in Revelation chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, where it talks about the uh, long-haired, uh, bestial type of uh, locusts that come uh, upon uh, the the people who don't have the mark of God on them, and they see those as the Parthians, and in, in, in we're talking about in ancient history or in the uh, time when Rome was sacked, and, and they look at, at some of these being fulfilled at that time, but uh, that's a little bit different, though, than actually claiming to be in that final, final, final segment of church history as you do when you get into Revelation chapter 2 and 3, as some of the, the historicists claim. So, th yes, that is problematic, because then you're setting yourself up to believe that you are, in fact, in the very, very last days, and Christ has to return in your lifetime almost. And, in fact, that, that is, I, I think, the view of many people. But I don't think so much of the historicist view uh, causes people to think like this. I think it's more this aspect that because we are approaching the year 2000, that therefore Christ must 
return, and, and uh, I, I deal with that a lot in my book, The 99 Reasons, because there is this underlying assumption among many evangelicals that, according to Bishop Usher's chronology, the world began on 4004 B.C., that's when Adam was born, and the world's going to last 6,000 years, and the 7,000th year is going to be the millennium, and it correlates with the Sabbath day, because a day to the Lord is a thousand years, and the, set, the, the uh, and so forth. And so, therefore, the seventh day of rest will be the thousand-year millennium. Therefore, 6,000 years have happened since 4004 B.C., and now we're approaching the year 2000. Mm-hmm. Guess what? <laughs> the next, uh, after the, the year 2000, we're entering into that 7,000th uh, year, or the millennium, and that is what is the underlying assumption. Uh, this was Usher's view, or this is a view that people have taken Usher's number and expanded it into? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the question. Well, was this was this view that you've just stated, was this Usher's view, or is this something that people have just taken Usher's number and used it to build their own viewpoint? Yeah, Usher is the one who created the 4004 uh, B.C. date, and I, I'm not sure if he, in fact, uh, related it to... Uh, that Christ would come in the year 2000, but definitely people after him have held to this. And, in fact, a a lot of uh, Christians still hold to this. Um, I could think of Salem Kirban, who wrote the uh, Prophecy Bible, and also the bestsellers, the novel 666 and 1000. Mm -hmm. Uh, He he holds to this. Um, There's others who who also hold to this, uh, Jack Van Impey, uh, some of the other evangelical... Uh, teachers hold to this viewpoint of, of, well, this right here in the year 2000, we are entering into this 7,000th or the millennium year, and therefore Christ must return. But there's flaws in that, as I point out in my book, 99 Reasons. Uh, one of the major things that is overlooked is that if you date the beginning of time at 4004 B.C., or the reason Usher did, by, by the way, was by looking at the genealogies mm-hmm. in the Old Testament, in G- Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 10, where it talks about that uh, Enoch begat Jared and, and so on and so forth, and there were so many years between them. Enoch lived 500 years and, and so on and so forth. And he calculated all those and came to the date 4004 B.C. But what's problematic with that is that these genealogies do not include every ancestor. In fact, if you look in Matthew chapter 1 and compare that with the book of Kings, you'll find the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 where it relates to the the, uh, the Vedic line of, of the Messiah, and you compare that with the book of Kings, you'll notice that there's around four different kings that are missing from that genealogy. And the reason why they're missing is because the Jews did not use genealogies to set dates or to have some type of chronological dating uh, back in time. They used it to determine ancestry and pedigree and symmetry, but not for chronology. And so we're misusing, or these people are misusing those genealogies, reading into them something that's not there, uh, ignoring the fact that they're, they're missing people within these genealogies, some of them not included because of their wickedness or uh, just for the, uh, for the sake of symmetry, or just simply because the Jews, in their mind, when you're the son of so-and-so, or it, it really just means that you're the ancestor of so-and-so, or even says that Jesus Christ is the son of David. doesn't mean that David was Jesus' literal father or that uh, you know Jesus was around the same time that David was, it simply meant that David's the ancestor of Jesus Christ. And so that whole misconception of the genealogies uh, uh, caused Usher to come to that 4004 B.C. date, which is, in fact, wrong. Both archaeologically, uh, you can look, and there's been civilizations, even Jericho, which uh, was the uh, Joshua conquered in uh, the book of Joshua, Jericho's been around longer than 4004 B.C. time, and there's others, there's Jarmo, there's uh, some other civilizations that have been around longer than 4004 
BC, and I, I've outlined them in my book, 99 Reasons. We've been talking a lot about evangelicals and cultic groups who are involved in date setting, but there's also another group out there of uh, secular individuals such as Scallion uh, who are prophesying Armageddon and setting dates as well. And I just wanted to have BJ comment on that. Yes, uh, Gordon Michael Scallion uh, is another one of these uh, soothsayers more on the secular side. Uh, I believe this publication is called Earth Changes. And one of the predictions already that he's predicted has proven false that is, in 1993, was supposed to be the year of great earthquakes. California was destined to be devastated, and the Golden Gate Bridge would be would flop into the Pacific Ocean or be severely damaged. Nothing like that took place. You also have a lot of uh, other secular or New Age individuals. Uh, Jose Arguez, who wrote the book The Mayan Factor, and predicts that the uh, end of this present era would be in 2012. Uh, A.D. And, of course, you have Gene Dixon and Nostradamus and others who have, uh, or, or their prophecies have been used to predict end-time dates. Mm-hmm. One of the uh, examples of Nostradamus, in fact, uh, one of the persons who holds to Nostradamus is uh, a man by the name of, by the, the name of uh, Ryuho Okawa, who claims to be the reincarnation of Buddha, and he's in uh, Japan. He also claims that he's the, more than the Messiah. The universe uh, are based on his words and his teachings, and he is the founder of the Institute for the Research in Human Happiness, which uh, claims two, th- two million members. And this is all true. <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about uh, uh, science fiction here, uh, although you would think so. But anyways, uh, his book, Nostradamus, Fearful Prophecies, he predicts in the 21st century Japan would survive the end of the world, and Japan would destroy the United States and and Russia, and China would become Japan's slave and Korea's prostitute. Uh, You also have others that use the prophecies of Nostradamus. In fact, there was a big scare right here in L.A. on May 10th of 1988, because according to a prophecy supposedly of Nostradamus, that there would be a major earthquake in what's considered the new city when there was a certain alignment of stars, and that alignment took place on May 10, 1988. Uh, Mount Wilson, which is uh, right here out in Southern California, and in, in, uh, in, in that area they detect uh, earthquakes, uh, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, should I say a Griffith Observatory, mm-hmm. was uh, getting flooded with calls that day from people who were just scared to death that on May 10th in 1988 uh, there was going to be a major devastating earthquake in, in Southern California. Well, there have been devastating earthquakes, but not one on May 10th of 1988. Mm-hmm. And, and so you see that uh, Nostradamus' prophecies are often used, and they have been used even in the past. The Germans in World War II used Nostradamus' prophecies to uh, predict that they would win the war. And Great Britain did likewise, and there was propaganda used uh, of Nostradamus' prophecies. And the reason why we say, well, how could this be? I mean, what are they doing? Nostradamus' prophecies are so vague that you can interpret them in a number of different ways. His main book called The Centuries is is based on quatrains or or like four-liner type of predictions or, or rhymes, you could say. And there's so many ways to interpret his predictions that you could basically get them to mean anything that you want them to do. And what people usually do is they point to the prophecy once it takes place, and they say, ah, see, Nostradamus predicted it. But any time they predict a future event, that event never takes place. And to to, uh, get a good laugh out of this, uh, next time you're in your video uh, rental uh, store, Check out the, book, the the video, The Man Who Saw Tomorrow. That's a, a video of Nostradamus. Yeah, Orson Welles. Yeah, Orson Welles yeah. Is, is the one who's, who's uh, hosting it. And Same it guy says hosted, that hosted uh, Hal Lindsey's program. <laughs> <laughs> it, says, it says that Ted Kennedy would win the election in, ni- in 1984, according to Nostradamus' prophecies. Mm-hmm. And that there'd be a worldwide famine that would occur in the 1980s and a devastating earthquake in 1988 and World War III would break out in 1994. All those predictions 
didn't occur. Right. Yeah. Now, um, just real briefly, I wanted to go ahead and read from Deuteronomy chapter 18, starting with verse 21. And that says, if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word, the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing with which the Lord has not spoken, and the prophet has spoken presumptuously. So here we find the criteria of what a false prophet is. And even if they do have, say, maybe they do have a couple of predictions that come true, they are not 100% accurate. Right. And case study or case example, a perfect case would be Jean Dixon. Now, she's heralded as the woman who predicted John F. Kennedy's assassination, mm -hmm. and that just um, shot her into stardom because of that. But we forget something here, and even to this day, that Jean Dixon makes a bunch of prophecies. Now, you could pick up any of these uh, tabloids uh, in your supermarket stores and look at those at the beginning of every year, usually somewhere around the first week of January, there's predictions. The psychics predict. Pick one of those up and look uh, at Gene Dixon's predictions and whoever else they have there, whatever other psychics they have there. Uh, wrap up that magazine and open it up New Year's the next year and see how many of those predictions came to pass. You know, what's, the, what's the old saying, even a broken clock is right twice a day? <laughs> uh, when I was saying about Orson Welles, um, I, I meant uh, his, uh, he was the host of the 79 edition of a movie called Late Great Planet Earth, which was based on Hal Lindsey's book. And I, I kind of wanted, before we get too far um, away from this particular point, I wanted to mention that Hal Lindsey uh, is not someone that we would normally consider in the same circles as Gene Dixon and Nost uh, Nostradamus. How does he fit into our discussion today? I think uh, the difference between Hal Lindsey and date setters is what I would write in my book, uh, the difference between a date setter and a date suggester. There's a distinction between the two terms. Date setters are those who hold affirmatively or dogmatically a certain date for the end of the world or the rapture or the second coming of Christ. Hal Lindsey is different in that he just suggests dates. What he does is, for instance, in 1948 he said that, okay, you have Israel returning to Palestine, and this, he claimed, was fulfilling prophecy. And according to Christ in Matthew chapter 24, this generation will not pass to all these things be fulfilled. So he said that a uh, generation, according to scripture, is usually 40 years. Therefore, Christ might return in 1988. And in fact, he still says that it's this generation and we're living in the final generation. Obviously, 1988 came and went, and so he had to reevaluate that and now uh, he bases that, well, it could be 40 years from the uh, uh, Yom Kippur War, or it could be 40 years from when Jerusalem was taken. It could be 40 years, or it could be uh, maybe 70 years. And so there's uh, multiple ways to, to date that, but at any rate, uh, he would affirm that we're living in the final generation. I, I find that problematic because you don't totally escape date setting by doing that. And as 1988 came and went, uh, we, we find that people bank on these more credible teachers like Hal Lindsey, uh, like uh, Grant Jeffries would be another example of this, and like these other teachers, Jack Van Impey, who are respected evangelicals, and other date setters look at that and they find them toying with dates, just suggesting, they don't say affirmatively or dogmatically, they just say, well, Christ could return on this day, it's possible that this could happen on this day, but they take those predictions and they run with them and they, they make them uh, dogma at that point. That's exactly what the Hugo movement, the Korean group, did with Jack Van Impey's prediction of 1992. They banked on Jack Van Impey's prediction. That was one of the, their supports for their prediction of October of 1992. It was something that Jack Van Impey said uh, over uh, the, the airwaves. Yeah, so, by the time it filters down into the, through the grapevine, it, uh, a, a possible return of Christ has become a definite return of Christ. 
Yes, exactly. I, I've noticed that there tends to be a lot of, uh, again, among, like you were saying, otherwise respectable teachers that deal with prophecy, there tends to be a lot of looking at the newspaper headlines and seeing what's currently going on and then flipping open to our uh, our various uh, ap apocalyptic passages and seeing, well, uh, okay, does that look like what we see here? Are we really uh, living in, in what's been turned quite often the end times uh, are these is this something that we should really be aware of I mean it seems to go on quite a bit and is accepted in in evangelical circles and again like you said nobody is claiming within these circles to say Christ is definitely coming at this time but like you said they keep very strongly suggesting that we're on this particular timeline should we uh, be wary of, of of any kind of statements that that look at scripture and look at newspaper headlines and try to draw a correlation yes uh, we should look at that with a with a very uh, much suspicion because in fact I've outlined in my book that there's three basic errors that are committed by people who set or suggest dates. One of these errors uh, is what's known and what I call uh, newspaper theology. And that is when you correlate what's happening in the news with scripture and just try to, to mix, mix and match the two all the time. Uh, we've seen predictions and predictions based upon newspaper correlations uh, come and go without any fruitation. I could give you an example. Back in World War, right before World War II, there was a big scare that Mussolini was the Antichrist. And if it wasn't Mussolini, it was Adolf Hitler. Now, not only that, you had uh, wars and rumors of wars going on in the 1930s leading up to the uh, World War II. You had famine. You had the Great Depression which not only affected the United States, but worldwide this depression hit um, virtually everywhere. You had corruption, uh, you had the mafia, you had all these things coming out, Al Capone. You had uh, an earthquake in Long Beach, you had a, a devastating earthquake in India in the 1930s. And there, was people, there were people that were pointing that the, this war, the Nazis and, and World War II, this is it, folks, this is the end. And, it, and you could correlate a lot of the things going on there, uh, even the concentration camps with the, the Jews having to receive a number on, uh, on them or being marked and so forth with the mark of the beast and, and all these correlations. And here we are over 50 years later, and we realize that that generation has come and, and gone, and uh, the Antichrist did not appear, the end has not taken place, and Jesus Christ has not returned. And so we see that there is a danger of over-speculating and trying to compare newspaper with the Bible. Uh, BJ, I wanted to go ahead and address another topic right quick, and that's the subject of prophets and prophecy. Now, it appears to me that prophecy uh, can also be very profitable uh, because of all the videos and everything that are produced, and I just wanted to have you comment on that. Um, as a matter of fact, it was Edgar Wisnett, who distributed uh, about 4 million copies of 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Would Happen in 1988 worldwide. You have Hal Lindsey's book, The Lake Great Planet Earth, was the best seller of the 1970s for the nonfiction category. To this day, uh, you have uh, Thief in the Night and Distant Thunder and some of the videos that talk about uh, eschatology are the top-selling videos, and they're uh, about 25 years old already. So, yes, there is definitely an interest and intrigue regarding prophecy, whether, whether good or bad. And I think the, the reason why there are so many people who are intrigued by prophecy is, well, first of all, and then I've outlined some of these in my book, too, uh, one of the reasons is that there's a natural interest, I think, that people have as part of human nature to want to know the future. Mm -hmm. That's why we have psychics. That's why you have psychic hotlines on, on your late-night uh, junk on TV. Then you also have uh, one of the other reasons is that you have this, once again, this idea that in the year 2000, 
something significant is going to take place. And if you look at it from, from one perspective, that this is only the second time in Christian history that we're reaching a thousand mark. The last time was the year 1000, now it's the year 2000. Uh, you, you do have something significant going on, but when you start tying that with the second coming of Christ, then that's when you start uh, overstepping the prophetic boundaries. And this is why I believe there's going to be a proliferation of date setters coming up in the next five years as we approach the year 2000. Yes, and as a matter of fact, uh, going back to the year 999 A.D., there was a big scare that the year 1000 would herald the, the coming of Christ. Uh, so much so that there were people that, that would go to St. Peter's Basilica and uh, cry before the altar, and, and there was a, a big scare on New Year's Day 999 to the year 1000. Uh, just like you see uh, things gear, getting geared up to do that again for the year 2000. Now what about Columbus? You mentioned him in your book. Yeah, as a matter of fact, Columbus uh, did say to set a date for uh, some prophetic events also. In fact, uh, there's some speculation as to whether he himself even considered that he was the Messiah or, or maybe the forerunner to the Messiah. He definitely believed that he would lead a Christian army in the final crusade that would uh, eventually convert the entire world to Christendom. And his calculations led him to uh, the date of 1656. And so uh, even Christopher Columbus uh, had, had a set of dates. So well, we see that this is uh, part and parcel of probably uh, the American tradition. But I think since the, the late great planet Earth came out around 1970, uh, we've seen uh, uh, a proliferation of this taking place, and perhaps the, the reason would be that, well, we do li live in the nuclear era, and we also have seen drastic changes from the 1950s to the, say, from the 70s. From the 50s to the 70s was a drastic change of the entire worldview or the entire culture of American uh, society. You know, you had the flower children, you had the hippies, you had the Kennedy's assassination, Martin Luther King assassination, you had uh, Vietnam, you had all these things that took place in so many, uh, in, in just a, a few years' time within that decade, that people were looking uh, around 1970 and saying, man, what on earth is happening? Mm -hmm. what, uh, what's going to happen by 1980 if this trend continues? And there was a natural fear of what on earth are we, are we headed up to? Mm -hmm. And so Hal Lindsey's book came out at the perfect time. Uh, because it gave a blueprint for the future to a lot of people, and, and they found their answers, or they thought they found their answers through that book, and that's why it, one of the reasons why it became the bestseller in the 1970s. Hmm. Becky, you're on the air. What can we do for you? Yeah, well, yes, I, I wanted to comment on kind of a continuation of your conversation and then ask uh, your guest a question. Um, I think one of the reasons that you see so many people interested in end-time uh, prophecy and, and events, uh, there's a curiosity about it, but I think for the Christian, there can be a fear about it or a con connected with it. It could be a, a fear of, well, what's going to happen to me or the people I'm praying for that haven't come to faith yet, or it could even be a fear of how much am I going to have to personally suffer. And I think we have to, to really remember that... Um, that God has not appointed Christians to receive his wrath. Um, and, and we see assurances of that throughout uh, the New Testament, that God has not appointed the believer to wrath. So I just want to kind of say that that is one thing that Christians need to encourage one another as we do approach the year 2000, because I think there is a fear that Satan can attack the uh, believer in Christ with that is um, really an attack of the enemy. Would you agree with that? Or Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, you, you've touched upon a point that is very significant and, and I've uh, addressed in my book. Um, this is one of the other major themes. It's what I call comic book theology. And that's the idea of this uh, great grand conspiratorial theory of the Antichrist working behind the government, working behind everything that's happening right now to establish the mark of the beast. Um, and in this scenario, which many Christians are holding and adhering to, is this fear that 
because the government is, in fact, uh, they, oh, let's face it, they haven't made exactly uh, the best decisions uh, in the last several years. And, but taking a step from there and going on to uh, a secret conspiracy, the Illuminati, the New World Order, a uh, satanic, diabolic conspiracy that is so deceptive and so elusive that no one can figure out it's there. But then you have uh, men like Tex Mars and others who have actually exposed this uh, 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 conspiracy. And that, what it does is, uh, uh, unfortunately, it instills fear in Christians that, oh, man, it's too late to get involved in, in any political issues, or, or, or it's too late to get involved in society. Hey, let's head for the hills, folks, because the end is coming. Let's get out of the society. Let's, let's uh, drop all everything that, that has to do with, with anything in our society and, and head for the hills. That is exactly, I would say, what Satan would want, because when we do that and when we retreat from darkness, what we, in fact, are doing is being disobedient to the divine commission where Jesus Christ said to be salt of the earth, to be the light of the world, to get involved in these issues, to be light in darkness. And here at the Christian Church, some people are, are, are banking on that fear so much that they're uh, taking off from society. And so you see this phenomena happening today because of these conspiracy theories that are, that are going around of the Illuminati and New World Order and so forth. And so I deal with those issues uh, in my book also. Well, I would agree with what you're saying. I think <clears throat> any uh, listener out there that really wants to get into God's Word and look at what the Word says about, you know, dealing with your fear during suffering and the second coming of Christ, read the book of Second Thessalonians and go back and read the first book of Thessalonians because Paul was addressing people who were under severe persecution and affliction and uh, who were new Christians, by the way, apparently, because as far as we know from Scripture, he only spent maybe as little as three weeks uh, with them before he had to depart, and these letters back to them were to a, a new church that was undergoing a, quite a bit of persecution, and of, of course they had fear, and there had even been letters or a letter or a person circulating a rumor that the day of the Lord had already come and they'd been left behind, and and, and God's Word goes on to say, you know, don't be deceived. Uh, you know, all of these things have to happen before this is going to happen. And, I, and when I read those two books in the Bible, I see that it's, a, it's an admonition to the Christian to stay close to the Word of God because if you don't, you can be deceived, and part of that deception is the fear. Um, that brings me to the question I wanted to ask you. It's a two-part question talking about what do you... First of all, what do you consider to be the day of the Lord with a capital letter D, not date, but day of the Lord that the Bible talks about? Is that a, a one-time point in time and space or a series of events or a period? Uh, and second of all, uh, in Thessalonians it talks about, in uh, chapter 2, verse 3, it talks about the apostasy coming first, and what do you see as the apostasy, and how is that any different from false teachings that have plagued the church ever since, um, you know, the day of Pentecost? Okay, Becky, thank you very much for your question. Uh, BJ, go ahead. Okay, yeah. The day of the Lord is, in, in the most general terms, is God's day as opposed to man's day. Uh, I think that's probably the most succinct a way you could define it. But I think the book of Joel gives us a clue and, and key of, of how to understand the day of the Lord. If you look at the succeeding chapters in chapter 1 of Joel, chapter 2 of Joel, and chapter 3 of Joel, you'll find that the day of the Lord referred to an event taking place in Joel's own time, in chapter 1, a locust invasion. In chapter 2, it's referring to the uh, Syrian uh, Babylonian invasion that would up ahead according to uh, from Joel's perspective of things and also it was referring to the time of the uh, apostles because the apostles quote Joel chapter 2 uh, in reference to the day of Pentecost and then finally in chapter 3 it looks like a future event that's going to happen during 
the eschaton or the, or, the, or the final days before Christ returns. So there you have a perspective of, of uh, what the day of the Lord is. It's actually the judgment of God coming upon uh, the nations of the world, and it really doesn't give us uh, specifics as far as when this takes place, because they're, they're, it's so it's used in, in almost every type of situation or setting. It's used in the Babylonian captivity of 586 B.C. It's used uh, during the time of Christ, and it's, and it's in fact used uh, for the uh, end times. So uh, I, I would refrain from trying to just settle it on one particular episode or on one p particular period of um, the uh, redemptive history and look at it more in terms of uh, taking each text on its own uh, context, through its own context, and looking at what it means in this particular context. Uh, so there's no, uh, I don't think there's really any overarching uh, period that you can pinpoint the Day of the Lord to. It's, it's, it's in general referring to God's day as opposed to man's day. Yep. The, okay, yeah, there's another question about uh, the apostasy. Okay. Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about that uh, when Paul is comforting the Thessalonian Christians, and in fact, uh, I want to read that because that is, in fact, a, a very comforting passage for those who are disturbed by the, uh, the end times and, and the teachings of the end times. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, says, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering uh, to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy report or letter supposed to have come from us saying the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs, and that's the apostasy that's being referred to, uh, occurs, and the man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. So, and the question was, uh, what is this apostasy? Well, it's what we're getting into uh, an area where there's definitely a whole range of different interpretations of what this apostasy will amount to. But I have a feeling that if you connect it with First John chapter two, uh, verse eighteen, where it talks about the brethren, we are in the last days, and even as you have heard that Antichrist should come, even now are there many Antichrists. And John goes on to say in verse uh, 22 of, and 23 that who is the Antichrist is a person who denies that Jesus is the Christ. I think that this apostasy, uh, however, whatever the specifics are, I'm not sure of, but uh, one thing I would think that this apostasy uh, would center upon is the denial that Jesus is the Christ. And I think that is the... Um, center or the central focus of this apostasy how that's going to pan out i don't know okay uh thank you very much for your call becky and uh let's go on to carl carl uh, you're on the air hi how you doing yeah i saw something about nostradamus the other day uh, i really like to get really accurate information so i was studying the tabloids and it said something about nostradamus predicting this will be one of the hottest summers ever and i figured well that means if he works for the weather service we should expect it to be cold with snow right but anyway, the other thing I was going to ask was, uh, it was supposed to be funny, but I guess you had to be there. But the other thing I was going to ask um, uh, was uh, was about uh, this guy and the Supreme Truth guy. Can you hear me? Yes. The Supreme Truth guy in um, Japan that had that cult that was they trying to kill everybody? You know? Yes, yes. The, the people in that cult, right? And he's like David Koresh. Doesn't it seem that they would notice how aberrant these people are and also... I don't understand, like, were they really going to try to do mass murders and kill a bunch of people with that? Or was that like a government framed them? Or, and did they have all that nerve gas? And if they did, did the ordinary members of that cult, Supreme Truth cult, know that their, their leader, and I don't know what they were following this guy for, because he looked to me like he's been eating too much pizza. But, you know, he's a pretty big guy, like a Reverend Moon, but, but sumo wrestler Reverend Moon. But, well, he did. Okay, so, and then he's storing up sarin and nerve gas. So, like, did the average followers know that, that, that our leader and the big top people in that cult want to use sarin nerve gas to wipe out major parts of the whatever it was, the civil service there in Japan or the, 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 uh, 
what do you call it, the subway system? And, and if so, why would they follow somebody whose uh, ultimate message was mass murder? And also the people that followed David Koresh, um, you know, aren't the people that are in those cults and, and Reverend Moon's cult and that, um, that Jim Jones, don't they, don't they kind of snap that these people are kind of strange? I mean, are they stuck in those cults? Are they... Don't they kind of yeah. notice some kind of aberrant, like uh, David Koresh? He looked, he looked like he. Uh, he BJ, he looked... that's um, uh, that's a very good question. And by the way, thanks for your uh, thanks for your question, Carl. Uh, that's a very good question. Of uh, why is it that people, for lack of a better way of putting it, don't learn after a while? I mean, none of this stuff is really new. I mean, it's even in recent history, it's not new. It's stuff that is continually being repeated. And if one decides to examine church history, I guess it goes all the way back to uh, uh, the Montanist movement in in the um, in the third century or before. Why is it that people don't seem to be catching on to what's going on uh, in in these different movements? Well, that, that's one of the um, key issues of uh, understanding the psychological developments of a uh, cultic mind or a person who has been um, uh, bought into um, uh, some type of cult group. And it's really a difficult issue, but I think there's a, a number of different aspects that help us to see how it's possible. Uh, let's not, first of all, uh, escape the notice of what Scripture says, that one of the signs of the end times and the last days being, uh, according to New Testament, the entire church era, uh, the Apostle Peter saying that on the, in Acts chapter 2, that we are in the last days, and so John also, and so the entire New Testament uh, era is considered the last days. But one of the signs of these last days is that, in fact, there would be false prophets that would arise and deceive many, and we see that over and over and over again. So uh, we need to take that in consideration, for one. But why do these people get involved with these groups? Uh, one of the reasons, too, is there is the Imago Dei, or the image of God, that exists in every single person, whether believer or unbeliever. There is this uh, aspect of us, this immaterial part of us, that cries out for God, that cries out for something to do with religion. And so if they don't find it through a true relationship with Jesus Christ, then they start looking elsewhere, some type of religious uh, setting to fulfill that void inside their lives. And they'll join these groups, and a lot of times they join them naively and innocently, and as they get more and more involved in this group, they end up uh, start, uh, starting to follow this person's teachings and follow this person's interpretation of teachings. And uh, these, these cult leaders take the Word of God, twist it to such an extent that the commitment and the obedience that you find the apostles giving to Christ, they get, uh, get that type of obedience from their followers and even to the point that they get their followers to sometimes even say that, yeah, I'll die for you in, in, because I, 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 I believe in you and I follow you and I, and, I, and I love you so much that I'm willing to die for you. In fact, you have testimonies of people who have got out of the Unification Church, uh, the Reverend Sun Yung Moo, who did in fact say that, that they were willing to die and willing to kill for him. And uh, so... so what ends up happening is somewhere down the line, this uh, delusion comes in. Uh, delusion that uh, because of, of all this false teaching and false doctrine that is, is perpetrated, uh, it has a, 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 you could say, a, a, a deluding effect upon a person's mind where they lose their discernment, they lose their capacity to determine what's right and what's wrong, and whatever's right and what's wrong is de depends upon the cult leader. And I think that's one of the issues here. And then there's, there is a tendency within a lot of, of personality types to uh, not make their own decisions. They'd rather have other people make their decisions for them. Mm -hmm. And so they fall right along the line with whatever the leader says goes. And if, if uh, the leader says to go ahead and... Uh, take up arms and, and fight, it, fight it out with the government, well, you've got to remember something here. They've been already uh, conditioned to believe the government's the Antichrist, the government uh, is the whore of Babylon in the book of Revelation, 
And so they see it as a duking it out with the devil. And that's how they interpret it. And here's my leader. I'm going to obey him on this situation. And, hey, this is the end times, folks. So, so I mean, it, it's survival. It's all about survivalism. So, yeah, they get up arms. And it, the end or the mean, the, the end justifies the mean. Don't matter how we go about doing it, if we have to kill a few people on the process, well, that's it. But, hey, let's uh, win this uh, battle of Armageddon that's taking place. I think it was Paul that said that they would uh, bear that false teaching beautifully. And there's also a little phrase that I've coined, a teaspoon of truth makes the heresy go down. We are talking about date setting, and we just got a, a few minutes left. So, BJ, uh, I'd like for you to uh, just go over some of the 99 reasons why no one knows when Christ will return. Uh, categorize my uh, reasons into um, about 13 different chapters, and one of them focuses on reasons why no one knows the date through Scripture. Another one is no one could get around Matthew 24, 36, which says that uh, Christ said that you did not know the time, uh, the, the day or hour of my return. And then there's reasons why no one could decode a secret date through numbers, uh, reasons why no one knows that the millennium will start in the year 2000, reasons why no one knows the date through the signs of the time or current affairs or through modern day prophets, uh, sources outside the Bible through rumors, uh, no one knows who the Antichrist is yet, the mark of the beast, and uh, reasons why no one should set dates. Now, one of the main reasons is, in fact, reason number one. Scripture does not give us a specific date for the end times. Now, you can look and look and look to your blue in the face in Scripture, and nowhere are you going to find a Scripture that says, I will return in the year 2000, or I will return in 1994, or 1992, or what have you. It's just not there in Scripture. And I think that is one of the strongest arguments uh, why no one should set dates. And how then do these people come to setting dates? Well, they have to calculate and come up with these, these weird uh, mathematical scenarios to come up with some bizarre uh, uh, numbers and, and calculations, uh, and, and therefore they get to the date or the year of, of Christ's return. And I, I, I've outlined in Chapter uh, 3 of my book uh, how you can virtually manipulate any number to mean anything you want it to, to mean. In fact, I've calculated Harold Camping's name at 666 and Jack Van Impey's name at 666. And it's just to show not that these guys are the Antichrist, but just to show that you can, in fact, manipulate numbers in Scripture and manipulate names to get them to mean whatever you want them to mean. And I think that is one of the, the biggest errors uh, that, that uh, Christians going into this, they, they look at all these numbers and they say, wow, this must be, be, be right. But no, anybody could do it. If you, with just uh, adding, multiplying, and so forth, you could come up with these dates. So I think that's one of the strongest uh, arguments. The scripture really does not give us any specific date for the end times. Uh, before we get too far off that particular point, um, not to totally rabbit trail the discussion, but uh, I'm thinking at this point of passages like uh, Acts chapter 2 uh, verses 16 and 17 and also Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 that would seem to indicate that, that we are in the last days, or the last days began at Pentecost. How does this figure in uh, with what you're talking about? Yeah, um, that is a, a really good um, question, because that is the misconception, you could say, of this entire uh, generation that we live in, of evangelicalism, that we, we think that the last days is distinctively something that we're in, and no other person in history has been in. But since the first century, uh, believers have considered themselves to be in the last days. And that's because the last days, uh, when understood by the apostles and when under understood by uh, New Testament terms, turns out to be the entire New Testament era. So simply by declaring that these are the last days doesn't give us any uh, authority or basis for, for setting a date or even claiming that Christ will return in our own lifetime. We don't know that. He may, but he may not. We just don't know. And so uh, that's a, an important issue to, to really uh, understand that the last days, according to Scripture, is the entire New Testament era. Okay, let's move on. What, uh, uh, what are some of the other reasons you talk about in your book? 
I think uh, what's significant also is the uh, setting of, of Matthew, uh, this is reason number 15, setting Matthew 24, 36 in a different period from the Great Tribulation does not allow us to know that date. Uh, you find over and over again, in fact, this whole chapter talks about Matthew 24, 36, uh, um, and also another chapter, uh, uh, ch uh, reason is number 12, where no one can get around Acts chapter 1, verse 7, and so forth. These passages, Matthew 24, 36, and Acts 1, 7, are the crux of the whole issue here. What does Scripture tell us about setting dates? Christ said, it is not for you to know the time or season of these things. Plain English. And in fact, I like the way F.F. F. Bruce says it. It is none of your business to know the time and season of these events. That's how it reads uh, if, if you uh, take apart the Greek there. And this seems to be the error that the date setters over and over try to make with these passages. They have to run over these passages or turn them into theological pretzels, but don't take them for what they, in fact, are saying. Jesus Christ is discouraging date setting. What he desires and what the Bible desires, and you find this over and over in New Testament prophecy, is that we are to live godly lives, and that's the focus of prophecy. What is prophecy supposed to do, or what's the purpose of prophecy? It's to live a godly life so that whenever the Lord returns, we will be ready for him. Never are we commanded in Scripture to know the time of his return. Never are we commanded in Scripture to try to calculate or figure out the time of Christ's return. But always, over and over and over again in Scripture, we're told and exhorted that we're to live a godly life so that when Christ returns, we may go to be with him. This is exactly the point, and we find in Second uh, Peter chapter 3, in verse uh, 14, yeah, verse 14, that we're told to be found without spot and blameless whenever, we, whenever he returns. We're not supposed to know when, but we are supposed to be prepared. Yes, and in fact, in Revelation, the whole book starts out with, once again, the seven churches, and it's not indicated that we're supposed to interpret this as seven church eras, as the, the historicists might do, but what this shows us, the seven churches of Asia, and what the Lord focuses on is their godly or ungodly conduct, and he ends up rebuking the, the majority of them. And so once again, the focus of prophecy is to live a godly life, and that is uh, the, the crux of the matter there. And once we, we understand that, too, we realize that, that why do we try to play these pin the tail on the Antichrist type of games and, and pinpoint the time of Christ's return when Scripture discourages us from doing so, and all it does is encourage us to just live a godly life so that uh, when he returns, we'll be ready. And I would encourage those who are listening, who may be, do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that this is really the, the crux of the gospel, and, and tied into eschatology any, anyways, is that we shouldn't be so concerned about what's going to happen in the future, but what we should be concerned about is that we're not even promised tomorrow. The Bible says that man's life is but a vapor. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. The Bible also declares that, you know, we can't even boast of tomorrow because we don't know what a day may bring forth. Uh, you might die tonight. I might die tonight. And, you know, any number of scenarios could happen where we die. Are you ready to meet, meet Jesus Christ when you die? That is the most important message of the gospel uh, in reference to this whole aspect of eschatology. What happens to you when you die? And if you want that assurance that you can be with Christ for all eternity when you die, then the thing to do is accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior knowing and realizing that he died on the cross for your sins, that he was born of the Virgin Mary, he lived a spotless life here on earth, he's the Son of God, God manifested in the flesh, who took on the sins of mankind on the cross. Trust in him as your Lord and Savior and ask him into your heart. 
check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 